Good morning. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Bhaskar, and thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, congratulations and all the best to Analytics India magazine as well. Uh, every year, the conferences are getting bigger and better, and great to see the fraternity increasing by the day. Uh, so we represent a company called uh, Analytica Data Lab. We come from uh, deep banking and financial services background. So uh, many of us come from Citi Citigroup, JPM, uh, HSBC in our past lives. And now we are a part of uh, a startup trying to bring, drive innovation in the analytics and AI space. We are a analytics and AI platform solutions company. So as you could see, the first half of our, and we focus on uh, different industry verticals with a primary focus on banking and financial services and healthcare. So as you see, first part of most of our career, we focused on money. And in the second half, we still continue to focus on money, but we, we also realize that health is very important. So we are focusing on the two primary aspect of human life, money and health. And uh, these are, when we look at analytics and AI application, these are uh, fairly interconnected in terms of the, the, industry, the way the industry works. Uh, both are equally painful, highly regulated, but at the same time presents a lot of opportunity because the data has been, uh, has been there, it is well, <coughs> well guarded, and uh, there's, a, there's a variety of uh, data, rich information available in both the sectors. So, uh, so we have been uh, doing, uh, doing all right with our analytics and AI uh, platform solution. What we are going to talk about today is about the application. And we are going to focus bulk of our talk today on prescriptive analytics and how the stream is moving from prescriptive analytics to prescriptive AI. So we are going to uh, spend a little bit of time uh, explaining our point of view there. And then Iti is going to take up a use case, which is very, very, uh, very close to what we do and try to demystify and explain the application of prescriptive analytics and AI uh, for a real uh, case in healthcare. Okay. So we have, uh, you know, much has been talked about the different streams of analytics, descriptive and diagnostic. Sometimes these two are being interchangeably used. Uh, and we have, and there has been a lot of steam that has been gathered in the last couple of years on the predictive analytics space as well. Now, prescriptive analytics space which is now catching up because of the advent of the technology and the progress that is being made, now we are, we are able to make very tailor-made prescription to the business. So when you compare the four streams, descriptive and diagnostic focuses on what happened and why that happened. So if you take an example of uh, customer analytics where if you're focusing on why your customers are at writing, as an, as an example, then when you are generating a lot of reports and visualization to describe the fact on what happened, how many customers are tried, let's say, at different market segments, uh, different parts of the year, where, where is the spike and where is the crest and the trough, so that will fall in the, in the category of uh, descriptive analytics. When you, st when you start diagnosing that why, what could be the probable reasons why the customers are leaving us, then it gets in the diagnosis space, so you formulate certain hypothesis, you try to validate or reject that hypothesis, then it gets into the diagnostic space. When you try to predict what's going to happen in the future, who is going to, uh, who is going to try it uh, in the next uh, six months to one year time frame or any time frame, then you're getting into the predictive analytics space and there are different uh, algorithmic approach, machine learning is playing a crucial role in the predictive analytics space uh, as well. Uh, we are also now getting smarter, not only figuring out who is going to attract, but also when, when the customer is going to attract. Now, when you, you have all this information in the, in the three streams that I spoke about, descriptive, diagnostic, and predictive, you need to get to some action because the business works on top line and bottom line, so you need to, you need to uh, apply the insights, you need to apply your uh, predictive strength to do something, right? To optimize certain action, so in this case, if you get to know that your customers are attracting in next six months, and also you, you get to know uh, specifically at an atomic level who is going to attract when, when is the right time, and what kind of action do you do take now, 
so that that so that the customer doesn't doesn't get right, right? Uh, so that comes in the space of uh, prescriptive analytics. So when you see the growth in the field, there is about 18% uh, CAGR, about six to seven years, seven years CAGR of 18% uh, of the on the descriptive and diagnostic space globally. Uh, predictive is growing at 22% uh, rate. And uh, prescriptive analytics is going to grow. It is, it is already 31% projected for 2024, right? So let's, uh, let's, let's take, a, take a little bit uh, deeper look on, on what a prescriptive analytics uh, mean, right? So the, uh, if you, many of you, I'm sure most of you have noticed when, when about a few months back, uh, Sundar Pichai demonstrated that their duplex AI, uh, right? Which was, which was a Google Assistant, and he demonstrated how a conversational AI uh, played the role in terms of booking appointment for a haircut, and uh, then the next one was a, was a restaurant uh, appointment, restaurant uh, table table booking. Now the first one went went well as expected, and the conversation was as if a human being is speaking. The second one, where well, the the conversation did not go as expected, but however, uh, the duplex AI quickly optimized the action based on the information which was presented in front of it, right? That is where the deep learning and the NLP algorithms are coming into play and resulting into some kind of a prescription so that the machine can take action based on the latest information as well as, well as comparing uh, the historical data, even if there was not a definitive instance of something happened in the past. So that is an example of prescriptive analytics where you are continuously optimizing. So optimization plays a critical role. Now optimization, when you look at it as a science, and uh, when, when, you, when you club it with your prescriptive analytics, then it becomes a blend of a science and art where your different methodologies can, can counterplay and, and optimize certain action which is, which is optimal for the, for the case and point. And there's a stochastic optimization which also plays a role where a lot of uh, random assumption has, is being uh, made and then there is a there's a uh, contoured way of reaching to a goal. So we are, we are going to, so I'm going to stop here and I'm going to hand it over to my colleague uh, Iti, who is going to take it from here. And we will also save some time to demonstrate our solution and how we are driving the prescriptive analytics and AI space. Just that click up. Yeah. All right. Uh, right. So good morning, everyone. My name is Iti. Uh, thank you, Satimoy, for introducing me. And first off, I'd like to apologize. I'm coming off a very bad cold, so if you hear me coughing in between, my apologies. So Satimoy talked about the traditional prescriptive analytics. That's been around for a while. A lot of us have actually been talking about it. But what is prescriptive AI? Basically, in the traditional world, prescriptive analytics lacked scale, speed, and application. Now, that's where AI comes into play. That's where all your deep learning models come into play. Once that comes into prescriptive analytics, now you're seeing businesses actually realize value from prescriptive analytics. And that's really important. Going back to the example that Satyamoy was just talking about, the customer attrition example, say you were actually at the contact center when the customer called up with some kind of complaint saying, oh, you know, this service is not going well, I'm really not happy with everything. Then, if you actually had all of that information saying, oh, this customer is about to attrite, you could actually make an offer to that customer at that point of time, and you can save him. And that is the value that a prescriptive AI solution can drive for your organizations. And talking about value, if we really want to know why all of us are here, it's actually because of this figure. $1.88 billion. That is a very rough estimate that Gartner has made about the value of prescriptive analytics software by 2022. And that is why all of us are here. How can we actually drive value from our solutions? But how can we actually make it work? And Honestly, as analysts, all of us have been in that situation where you know, we've been working in analytics for a very long time, but when it comes to driving value, we really don't have something tangible to show. And that's what prescriptive analytics can help you do. It can help you realize tangible value. But before we get all excited and say, okay, let's start implementing prescriptive AI, here's something that you do need to realize. There are certain limitations of implementation. And these limitations are being worked upon by a lot of platforms. But before we kind of get into the mode of building faster, better solutions, we need to realize these implementations. The first one 
handcrafting. Now, what do I mean by handcrafting? Handcrafting is basically programming. Now, when we all started out, we all used to code lengthy programs to develop a model. Once the program was made, then the business user used to come and say, all right, this is a great model, but I want certain uh, business rules also to be built into the model. There you go, another couple of lines of coding to accommodate all of those pieces. And as you realize, with time, the code became bigger and bigger, and you know, it became even more difficult to debug a code if something went wrong. And we realized that all prescriptive analytics solutions were taking very long to get implemented. Now, you have softwares out there who are actually making a change and developing platforms that can allow you to build these functionalities as point and click and quickly operationalize your prescriptive analytics solution. But you have to remember, the more you depend on handcrafting, the more difficult it is going to be for you to get your business users involved, because they will not be able to come in and tell you what rules they would like to see on the platform. Coming back to a business user, I actually have a story. So at one point of time, I had a very a uh, dear friend of mine who's now, who was a client at one point of time, he came to me and said, you know what, these analytics and models is fine. I really don't know what to do with your output. The model output makes no sense to me. So what do I do about that? Well, that's the biggest problem that prescriptive analytics had at one point of time, which was UX development. How do you make your end user actually use your solution? For that to happen, you obviously have to think of developing a UX that he or she can interact with, right? If he wants to put in an optimal budget and wants to play around with that marketing budget, so be the case. If he wants to actually see, so what should I do? Should I contact him or should I not contact him? You should be able to give him that information. If you try giving him a probability score or if you try giving him, uh, you know, uh, this is what the model output is, he or she may not be able to use that output effectively. And the third most important thing, in my opinion most important, is explainability. With all of the advent of AI and ML, we are, we are all very happy, you know, as coders, all of us are loving it because we can now run so many more models, we can try out so many different things. But what about the business user? The business user is the one for whom you were developing this prescriptive solution. Now, this business user is suddenly going to have a challenge actually using your particular model because he doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand what it is that the model is trying to do. And you're already seeing that there are a lot of platforms out there in the market who are doing a lot of work around explainability. Uh, we have even a talk here uh, which is about explainable AI, so do go attend that talk. But yeah, basically, you know, there's going to be a lot of conversation around SHAP values, line values, and how do we ensure that we have what-if tools built into the platform. But these limitations are something that you need to keep in mind when you are implementing your prescriptive analytics solution. Let's ensure the business user buys your solution, he can play around with your solution, and most importantly, if he wanted to tweak something, he has the flexibility to tweak it as well. Now, I'm going to talk about some real-world use cases of prescriptive AI. Some of them I have worked upon, some of them my colleagues have worked upon. Um, these sound very simple, right? Like, cash management sounds very boring. They're like, oh, why is she not talking about a fancy campaign management platform or a campaign management thing? That's already there. People are already talking about cash of uh, campaign management. But these are the ones that actually are being implemented and are actually giving our customers huge growth and huge savings, right? So in banking, you have cash management and portfolio optimization as some of the use cases that banks are working on. Uh, cash management would basically be ensuring that you have enough cash, right? And making sure that you have your working capital figured out. Portfolio optimization, how do I optimize my portfolio? for best results. CPG, you have a lot of work going around trade promotion optimization and sales and operation planning, which kind of makes sense from the fact that if I am going to give you a dollar, I better get the best bang for the buck. Retail, again, a lot of work going on in price and promotion optimization. I am, I've actually spent quite a lot of my uh, years of analytics in retail industry, so I've actually worked a lot on price and promotion optimization and recommender systems. And I don't think I need to explain anything to you all about recommender systems. In the past week, I'm 100% confident all of you have logged into Amazon or Netflix and checked out their recommender systems. 
Now, the next vertical that we are talking about is healthcare providers. And actually, that's a use case that I am going to show to you all. Healthcare providers, uh, the biggest work that's going on around in healthcare providers is staff and service optimization. And it's really important in healthcare to get that optimization right, because at any given point of time, you have patients who need your attention. So how can I ensure that I get the right information across to my team so that they can optimize their delivery. All right, now, coming on to my platform, or our platform, ATH Precision. It's Analytica Treasure Hunt Precision. Uh, you can always stop by at our booth to get a detailed demo of the platform. But what the platform is, basically, it is actually an ecosystem that we have developed for all of you business users and data scientists to build your models, operationalize your models. This is where the whole prescriptive analytics piece comes into play, uh, play and deploy it at higher and deploy it as soon as possible so that you can actually start realizing the value. I'm going to give you a brief uh, walkthrough, a, a brief concept video that will help you understand the platform. Regardless of the size and nature of businesses, rapid adoption of machine learning and artificial intelligence is a must-win battle for enterprises, and non-adoption of these capabilities can put them in disadvantageous trajectories. Enterprises fail to capture the true potential of machine learning and artificial intelligence because of suboptimal approaches due to lack of contextualization of machine learning and artificial intelligence to their businesses, slow adoption due to the complexities involved in connecting <coughs> to different data, tools, technologies, techniques, and nuances of deployment at scale, lack of discipline on adoption fed by operating in silos and broken collaboration amongst functions and teams, ineffective traditional methods to institutionalize the experiences and learnings along with significant dependencies on human talent. An analytics ecosystem is a great solution for enterprises to take a lead on their machine learning and artificial intelligence journey. Analytica presents an innovative experiential analytics ecosystem called Analytica Treasure Hunt. Two, contextualize the machine learning and artificial intelligence solution specific to one's business needs. Connect to any type of data, tools, technologies, techniques, and or applications to not only develop, but also automatically deploy scalable solutions in production. Collaborate across functions, tools, technologies, languages, professionals, and teams to leverage expertise and have a strong, disciplined approach. Institutionalize the experiences and learnings which were gained while solving the problem for intelligent reference and reuse for training, audits, leverage, etc. This ecosystem is ATH Precision, and it is helping enterprises set up and scale their machine learning and artificial intelligence adoption at four times the speed with 100% accuracy. By solving for various business challenges or complexities like retention of experience and subsequent leverage of the same, seamless connectivity, working in code-free or coding console mode, access to 600 plus inbuilt algorithms with 100% result accuracy with over hundreds of features and customizable functionalities, rapid speed of execution, record retention, auto documentation, and recreation of analyses for audits with full transparency, extraction of the final analytic solution to operationalize the same at scale. Analytica Treasure Hunt Precision, the one-stop and the only experiential analytics ecosystem for your enterprise. Visit us at analytica.com slash precision to know more. All right. So I was talking about our client and the problem that they had. So our client happens to be one of US's largest EHR providers. EHR is Electronic Health Records Providers. Uh, they had an issue, which was basically they get a lot of complaints, or their customer support team gets a lot of complaints. And they need to identify whether the complaint is a P1 or a P2. Now, you must be thinking, what is a P1 or P2? Just a quick example, which has happened with me. Um, I landed up with, in the clinic with severe stomach ache, and after palpitating my stomach, my doctor goes, oh, your appendix is burst, you need surgery, right? Now, he had to ensure that the emergency services for surgery were available. So he punches in the records, and the records get transmitted to the surgical department, right? So that is a P1, something that needs to be done immediately because, you know, appendix is about to burst, she needs operation immediately. Versus, you land, I land up at the clinic, and 
I say I'm in severe pain after spending some time, he goes with, all right, it seems like you have gastritis and you could, you know, let's fix up an appointment. I'll give you some medicine to control the pain. Let's fix up an appointment maybe in another week with a gastroenterologist to figure out what's happening. That is a P2. So a P1 is something that is very important. It's life and death for certain patients and needs to be addressed immediately. Whereas a P2 is something that they can take some time on, but it still needs to be addressed. Now, all of these complaints are addressed by the customer support team. But previously, they were going through the complaints, they were reading the complaints, they were figuring out, okay, this is P1, this is P2. That was obviously taking a lot of time, and it was obviously hampering their efficiency. So we had to develop an NLP, or a, a NLP AI solution that would help them quickly address all P1s and go, go on and recognize which is P1 and P2. And at the end of all of this, they still have to report to the healthcare board how long they are taking to record each of these complaints, because that is a regulatory requirement in US. So that was the problem that my client was facing. How did we go about operationalizing this particular solution? Well, we looked at the solution within our platform, which is ATH, which we just talked about, right? We've developed our machine learning uh, algorithms within the platform, and we also contextualized the problem because an NLP and AI solution for healthcare will obviously be look very different for something that we would develop for any other industry. So we went ahead and contextualized the entire solution within our platform. And how it currently works is that, you know, the customer has a database where all the queries are coming in. The database passes on the queries to us. This is a real-time uh, movement of queries to us. The entire um, solution gets run on our platform, right? So the entire data processing, model development, solution extraction, everything gets run on our platform. And with, uh, with an API call, we connect back to the customer CRM solution. So this is not so much uh, something that we are doing at the moment in our system. What we will show you as a mock-up today is within our system, but this is not something that is uh, done for the customer in our solution, because as you realize, it's healthcare, it's US, so obviously it's all deployed within their system and everything happens on their system. So there's an API call to their CRM system. They see what needs to be done with each request, and obviously we have a feedback loop to understand how we are categorizing and further refine our models. So now I'm going to quickly take you through a demo on my system where I'll show you how we've deployed it for the customer. Also, uh, if you look at the data and you wonder why is there rooms and upscale facility, I cannot show you patient data as well. So this is mocked up on hospitality data. All right. You can continue. Okay. <clears throat> right. Um, so when you come into our system, this is basically how it looks. All the cases that you're currently working on, or all the cases that you're in the process of developing, all of them will be listed down over here. So this is the one that I was talking about, which is the customer support analysis. So this is how our workbench looks like primarily. On the left-hand side, right here, you have all the tables that you're working on, and you can rename the tables if you want to. And these are the 600 plus functions that we talked about in the video. All of them are available over here, so we have text analytics functions as well. And you know, you can basically point and click and um, run each of these functions. And as you, you know, run the functions, each of the steps are getting captured right here. And once this entire process is done, you can go ahead and extract your solution. Now, 60% of the models that are developed are never operationalized. This was a recent Gartner study. So we ensure that every model that you build, you have the ability to go ahead and deploy it. So we've created this extract and deploy where you can deploy it within your platform. Now, this is how a platform will look for a person who's working on it. But obviously, we are going to walk, to walk you through the solution that we develop for our customer. So now if you come back here, you see these My Solutions. This is where all the solutions that you are currently running will be listed out, right? So you can come here and come to that solution list, and then you can go in to the solution. So this is the solution we were talking about. What happens? A customer support guy comes in over here, he selects, all the, sol he selects the solutions, quickly runs this generate, and when he does run this generate, what happens is our entire algorithm that we had developed that runs through and 
we just tell you who do you have to reach out to first. So we created this little classification metric over here, which helps them realize which is a high priority request or a medium priority request. And like you can see, Ms. Jessica Stewart needs to be reached out to immediately because that's a high priority request versus a Jonathan Doe, which is a medium priority request. Uh, the confidence score is more for us so that we can look at the data. But for a customer support team, who started off with, what should I do with my data so that I can reach out to people quickly, this is what it is. He just sees the red. He knows that needs to be, that needs to be prioritized over anything else. All right. And in case you were wondering what it is that we did in the back end in terms of developing the solution, well, uh, we started off with Navebase. It gave us a 79% capture rate of P1. But, you know, healthcare, 71% is obviously not good enough, right? We have to get better at it. Next round, random forest. And by the way, all of this was done within the platform. We used the point and click functionality. Ran nave base, gave us 79%. Ran random forest, gave us 95%. But we were still not happy. We wanted to get as close to perfection as possible. We ran word to WEC with a multi layer perceptron. That gave us a 99.7% capture rate. And now, obviously, 99.7, still not good enough for us. We continue to evolve. And in a couple of days, we will be deploying a BERT plus multi-layer perceptron for our customer. And we are hoping that this will give us the best perfection that we can possibly give to our customer till something new comes in the market. And then we will go ahead and try that too. So the whole idea is that you can go ahead and keep trying out whatever needs to be done within the platform, refining the solution, and then going ahead and deploying it. So any questions at this point of time? Yes. Can you uh, pass on the? This person. Uh, hi. Uh, so my question uh, is like, uh, when you collect the data, is it a, like, for example, like a X-ray data or uh, maybe CT scan data or maybe some other digital data which uh, you capture through the device, uh, like uh, like G or Philips, which is deployed at the healthcare sector? Are you passing those uh, data towards your platform, or it is a textual data which is fed by a customer service which is sitting at the front and solu yeah. solution? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So uh, just one quick thing, and good point that you brought that up. Uh, when I say customers, I mean the clinics and the labs that this EHR provider works with. So there is no end customer involved over here. This is the clinics, labs, hospitals that they work with, right? So they raise a request or they raise a complaint. Right? So they say, uh, or they say that, hey, you know, we need to get surgical services ready. We need to set up a gastro service for this particular customer. We need to set up x-rays. We need to set up scanning for the customer. So these are the kind of requests. These are electronic health records of, you know, these requests that are coming through to the customer support team. Okay. Those records will so, be passed through the NLP model. Yes, yes. yes. So in this particular case, it's primarily text data is where, mm. uh, you know, the doctor is typing something or they are calling a voice to text uh, transcripts. But uh, for different use cases, those kind of data is also, uh, you know, uploaded in the system, like x-rays and scans and, and AVs. Yeah. So one of the solution which is looks similar to that MIT proposed state, which mm -hmm. is basically you get a even digital data over it like a you, you have a digital data, then there are some number represented on digital data for CT scan. Yeah. There are some prescription below to that digital data, which clearly indicate this is a what, what are the level of prioritize? Like, mm -hmm. a, do you need to take this as a P1 or P2 or whatever it that? Right. Or do you need extended treatment for that? So uh, those data also like look similar. I'm mm -hmm. trying to figure it out. How, uh, this model versus which is digital as complex as possible, mm -hmm. how it will fit together. Like, yeah. So uh, uh, we, we need to uh, check uh, that, uh, that, that solution. But, uh, you know, algorithmically, there may not be much of a difference, right? Uh, okay. It's how you are uh, contextualizing. So our solution stands on four pillars. So contextuality is very important because many times you have the right tool people applying that, but when you are not connected with the business context, it may not work, right? Uh, then uh, connectivity and institutionalization and collaboration. So uh, what we do is we do an end-to-end -end solution 
fitting to the context and then prescribing the right uh, accent, which may uh, keep on improving over the time, right? So it's a, uh, it's a long haul process. So as you see, algorithmically also, it is getting better. Yeah. Now with BERT and uh, GPU, uh, we'll be able to even get to the 100% level. And uh, there, the business impact is going to be very, very high because they have about 600 people who are focusing on this kind of uh, uh, tickets. Now, if we cut it down to, let's say, half or even 60 to 70 uh, percent, so that much of a, uh, uh, you know, economics that you can translate it into. Uh, however, if it's 99 percent, you still need to find that uh, needle in the haystack, uh, whereas if it is 100 percent. So it will keep on improving and uh, with, uh, to build contextual solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for a good question. I have a question here. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I think this was a really good, insightful presentation. Thank you. Okay. I come from a pharma organization. So one question on the uh, extract and deploy methodology that you are following in your product. Typically in a uh, pharma environment, uh, there has to be a infrastructure where you have to first deploy your model or solution in a dev environment. Yes. Then it moves to the production. So. Yeah. So are you taking care of that particular component within your product? Yes, great. You want to take it? Uh, no. Okay. So yeah, so that's a very good question. So we have stagings, right? So, we, so once we, uh, like she said, that uh, we move our platform in, and it's a Dockerized uh, based uh, deployment. So we go and implement there. Then we have different staged environments. There's a development environment where the data scientists will work on, uh, on developing the solution. And it makes the job of data scientists easier because they, now they can do rapid experimentation. So they can bring in all the algorithms together and do a champion challenger kind of a mode and, uh, and keep on improving it. Once that is done, then it is extracted and, and packaged and transported. It's more like a SFTP to the production environment, in this case, they handshake with the uh, the customer, uh, you know, CRM system of the, the healthcare provider, mm -hmm. and that is where it is given at the hands of the of the representatives. All they need to do is based on the API, they just need to uh, need to get the ingest the data, select uh, that, and then run the algorithm, and they will get the traffic light of green, red, or yellow. Okay. So, uh, to uh, you know, short answer to <laughs> your question is, it is being staged, okay. different, okay. you know, and, and you know, some the environments are very very quarantined because we understand the. Uh, the the, uh, the the sensitivity of data yeah. security yeah, yeah right yeah. so uh, so i think i have a couple of questions on really hardcore nlp so yeah first question is really on don't you see when you get an accuracy of 99.7% yeah there could be a target leak or overfitting in the machine learning model that is the so yeah. how do you cater yeah, to that yeah yeah so so it is a, so the, that is where the, the algorithms come into play right so what to work uh, if you uh, uh, point out uh, Google has been kind of uh, you know researching on this for for very very long time so mm -hmm. they they provide the framework and then we contextualize based on the need so we take the MLP fr framework that Google has open sourced and then we we bring it to the context and every time there's a there's a you know number of iterations which are being run so we do uh, take into account the overfitting but uh, as you know many of you would know it's a is the latest algorithm that Google has released which uh, which is specifically for NLP and the text data, and it looks at the vector on the left-hand side as well as the right-hand side to contextualize. So it is it is fitting. So to give you an example, if a if a context of a, a bank come in, right now a bank can be a river bank or a bank can be a, a a bank for a for a financial institute. So when when Google looks at the entire sentence and the paragraph, they start uh, projecting it out to best fit in terms of the context based on the learning that the data has. Mm -hmm. So there is a there is a potential of overfitting, but when you run the iteration and bring the human eye in, that is being overcome. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one last question. So as far as uh, we know, uh, there is a latest model which is launched categorically, categorically for a pharma domain, which is mm -hmm. BioBird. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is predominantly trained on 1 million PubMed abstracts and articles. Okay. Okay. That is more closer to pharma domain. So mm -hmm. I think uh, maybe you can take a step back and think whether you should really invest time in BERT or directly go to BioBERT, which yeah. is predominantly focusing on the pharma sector. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thing. Thank Absolutely. you. That will be very helpful. And uh, see, we'll, with the quick research, we can ingest it in the platform. And uh, we have been, so we have about 600 algorithms which are here, and we are continuously, our data science team is ingesting. So we will take a note of bio, but yes. thank you. <coughs> yeah, here, uh, a question here. Excuse me. Hi. 
here. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, so in in this particular platform, right? Do you have a provision where I can read? I mean, a, uh, a customer can retrain their model after the deployment. Retraining? Yeah. Yeah. yeah of course. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, how do you validate if your model is getting better after the retraining or is it uh, is it going back like how do you validate your model yeah yeah so we will uh, we don't have much time to demonstrate here but please do visit us uh, we are exhibiting uh, the both both days so uh, short answer is uh, it is possible so for each of the cases there are different scenario generators and then uh, there is a way to do a we call it champion challenger where uh, when once we retrain then we retain the previous result and compare the metric, right? So for example, uh, three common metrics, sensitivity, specificity, and, uh, and accuracy, right? Uh, three of those can be lined up and normalized so that you can compare your results of the previous, you know. Do come over to our booth. We, yeah. we can walk Yeah, it'll through. take a little bit of time to show yeah. you. <laughs> no, we are at, yeah. Hi, yes. uh, I have one question. Uh, in earlier yes. slide, you mentioned about uh, the one use case or one work you have done for the banking industry cash yeah. optimi on cash management. Yeah. Could you please elaborate on what kind of prescriptive analysis we are doing for the <coughs> banking industry? Yeah. Um, so I can take that question. That's you. Yeah, right. I can take that question offline. Uh, I'm at my booth. Please come over. I'll no be problem. more than we'll happy to talk to you through that. Yeah, but, but many use cases. Many, many use, use cases, cases <laughs> are there, so you can def We yeah. are all banking guys. So yeah. I spent what, seven years in banking and then another four years in retail. So do stop by, we will walk you through. Just last slide. So you quick, know? Just, just a quick, uh, because I, I see we have a minute. So uh, see, uh, one of the prescriptive analytics is uh, same, uh, the attrition example, where you know that somebody, uh, person A is at writing, and person B is at writing with the same probability. But both of them may not have the, have the right kind of, uh, the same lifetime value. So if I were to choose between A and B, our, my algorithm should, should prescribe not only based on the predictive model, but also based on the economic lifetime value of the customer where A will be preferred over B. So yeah. that is one example of prescriptive. Uh, sorry. Weighable distribution of bar tuck. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so there are, you know, there are algorithmic uh, uh, interventions there as well. So you can do survival analysis yeah. to see, yeah. okay, that, you know, A is attracting in two months and B is attracting in four months. So I know that uh, based on that, I'll prioritize A, A over B. But if B is of higher economic value for me, I'll probably yeah. change my uh, uh, And decision. finally, your predictive analytics without a next best action can sometimes give you some very interesting result like, Dilbert over here. So hope you guys had a good time and enjoy the rest of the day.